For weeks, it has sensationalized the wrestling world. The rumor, would Mick Foley step down? Today, the great Mick Foley, the man with three faces, gives off the record a worldwide exclusive. He's done. I'm not willing to sit in front of the TV like a vegetable and uh, have people pity me and say he should have gotten out before that one last chair shot. Off the Record with Michael Landsberg is brought to you by the Keg Steakhouse and Bar. For great steaks, good friends, see you tonight. Television at its best lets you inside somebody's head where you go after you watch a performance. Wow, I didn't know that. Couple of turning points for this show. First of all, the interview way back when with Vince McMahon where we got inside his head and people said, wow, I didn't know that about Vince McMahon. And the one as well with Mick Foley. Since we did that interview less than a year ago, I would say I have been approached 10,000 times by people who said, Mick Foley, I didn't know him. He is the most incredible person I have ever seen on television. Great to welcome back to the show, Mick Foley. Good to see you, man. I had heard you say that to me uh, personally. I didn't know you'd go out on a limb and say that on your own show though. The reaction was staggering because more than anything else with Mick Foley there's the guy in the ring and then there's a guy sitting here and these are two different people and what it tells us is this is a performance. I want to talk to you about so much today including some big news which we'll talk about later on about the fact that you'll now look back on a career and not ahead or maybe ahead to a different one. But I want to talk to you about what you bring to the ring and we talk on the show all the time about athletes who don't bring enough, athletes okay. who don't commit themselves, athletes who don't pay back anywhere near what they take out. But you're the exact opposite. You have left, according to the back of your book, all kinds of broken bones and teeth and burns and all of that. I gotta ask you this question. Fans admire that, but your fellow athletes, are they threatened by that, given the fact that you can't follow Mick Foley into the ring? Well, first off, I'd like to thank you for uh, the first of what I hope will be many shameless plugs for my book. <laughs> No, you did the shameless plug. I didn't do it. Okay, yeah, you were just pointing to the back cover. I'm very proud of it. I, w I, I will shamelessly plug it throughout the show, if you don't mind. I don't care what subject you want to touch on, I will bring it around. How do you follow Mick Foley into the ring? These days, it's easy. I mean, and, uh, we have this shocking announcement coming up a little later, and uh, part of the reason the announcement is coming is because I'm not the same mankind or Mick Foley that I was even uh, 10 months ago when I was on this show. Um, I had matches in the uh, Sky Dome in Montreal at the Molson Center that were embarrassing by my standards, but I had fun doing them. And I think overall there's this like general feeling of goodwill towards me because I have done so many uh, physical things. Yeah, but I, I want to ask you about the guys that, that you work yeah. with. Do they resent you at all? Because you, you've set a standard up here. If this were high jump, you're jumping 12 feet. You're taking 12 chair shots. You're jumping down from the cage. Yeah. You're climbing back on the cage with a broken shoulder. Right. You have set the standard here. They can't help but even, they can't try to live up to that. Uh, you're making me look like a bad guy now. Uh, no, I think the, the younger guys look up to that. I hopefully they know that when I came off the cage and then got back up and came back through it and that when I took all the chair shots that that was too much for anybody and I mean I mean 18 months after King of the Ring I'm still hurting from it one of my teeth is still loose I'm going to lose my tooth eventually because of a accident that happened 18 months ago that's probably too too heavy a price to pay the uh, chair shots uh, to the head that many of them, it's probably too much of a price to pay. When you're starting to have trouble, you know, writing down numbers, it says to me, I may have, uh, may have gone a little too far. So uh, I think for some of the older guys, they're probably not resenting it. They're probably thinking I'm getting what I deserve. <laughs> <laughs> One of the problems is the audience, though, the expectation that the audience has. Yeah. Uh, because you do something like you talked about, jumping down from the cage, taking those chair shots, and now the audience wants more of it. Well, I think we can change the way the audience feels. I mean, if you put it uh, in the context of a, uh, of a soap opera for men or an action-adventure show, I don't think anyone ever expected Steve Austin to, do, to, to go way out there on a limb. I mean, Steve had a neck injury, uh, which may, we may have seen the last of Stone Cold in a ring. So God, the fans knew he couldn't be hit in the head with a chair, you know, and they'd look the other way when Steve, you know, you, had to, you have to put up your hands to, to block a chair if you've got a neck injury. 
And I, and I think Steve went way above and beyond what he had to do, seeing as how popular he was. I mean, Steve took some pretty, some pretty physical falls, and he was always giving 100% and probably didn't have to. I think it's a lot of the, the fact that the guys pushed themselves. To me, no fan ever said, well, are you going to come off of cages even higher, or are you going to take 18 chair shots? It was always me. Set, you know, setting the level You higher. do it yourself, though, but what happens now is that you can't go back in the ring, right, and be less than you've been. Well, you, I have, you've, I've you've been set doing a certain it for a while. And you say, like, that it bothers you, that you can't do well, it anymore. Well, it doesn't bother me anymore. I mean, in some sense it does, because I want to be remembered for being the, the Cactus Jack or the mankind that did all these things. But I didn't feel, I knew what I was providing yesterday in the Montreal Forum, some levity, a little bit of humor. And the fans at this point are, are applauding that and they're laughing along. But uh, I think, you know, I'd like to get out before, before that becomes the norm for me. I mean, uh, there's a grace period uh, that certain wrestlers have where people are willing to look the other way. And I, and I think it would uh, be best for people to remember Mick Foley the way he was. I, I have to address Owen Hart with you because it's such a, uh, a profoundly disturbing story, obviously, but so much uh, perhaps more so in Canada because he was so beloved here and because sure. he was a Canadian. Um, given the fact that you've risked so much in the ring in your life, and I know you were so close to Owen Hart, um, would you have wanted the show to go on if it were you? That, that's a tough call. I mean, I don't want to seem like uh, the, uh, the WWF. Um, when Vince said, you know, the show would, you know, Owen would want the show to go on. I don't know what any, how anyone could know. No one's ever addressed that. I mean, no one ever sat around a board table and said, what would you like to do if, you know, you were to, 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 to pass away in the ring? My feeling, that feeling be, I wouldn't want just the show to end. I'd want the world to stop for a while. Uh, but that doesn't happen. And it's not something that was ever addressed. I mean, that was never even within the realm of possibility. What do we do if a wrestler were to die in the ring? I'd never thought it. Uh, you know, in, in all my years, I don't. Vince McMahon had never thought, what if someone were to to, to die in the ring? So I, I don't want to criticize anybody's you know call. Uh, but you know, for me, I, you know, I would have been more comfortable if life around the world stopped for a few minutes. All right, we have to take a break, but we got a lot more to talk about, including, of course, uh, your announcement of a retirement, which you've alluded to. Uh, but it seems pretty clear what's going to happen uh, when we return. I want to talk to you about whether the war has resumed, not between you and another wrestler, but between your company, the WWF, and that other company, when OTR returns with Mick Foley, author of the new book, Mankind. Have a nice day. Do you think Hogan's gone? Do I think Hogan's yeah. gone? Come on, For now. Michael, come on. The guy uh, gave a retirement. Uh, see, then we talk about retirement. Anytime it's part of an angle, forget about it. Name of the book is Mankind. Have a nice day. A tale of blood and sweat socks. Great to welcome back to Off the Record, Mick Foley. Mick, uh, your company, WWF, lost a couple of key personnel. Uh, Vince Russo, Ed Ferreira went over to the WCW. A lot of people feel that they, those two were largely responsible, or at least in part responsible, for putting the WWF over. Does this signify a restart to the war between WCW and WWF? Well, actually, it would be nice if it did. I mean, when their show dropped down to nearly unchartable, <laughs> unchartable levels. You quoting Vince on that there? <laughs> no, I'm not. Actually, using a, a passage I used to describe a buddy of mine's grades in school, uh, saying they slipped to unchartable levels. Um, but when they, when they started sinking down, I didn't see it as a good sign that WCW was putting 1,000 people into 15,000 seat arenas. I liked it when everybody was doing great. I mean, I liked it when our show started beating theirs. But when, you know, when me and Rock uh, were on doing This Is Your Life and did an 8.4 and the other guys did a 1.6 with a wrestling match, you're saying, I don't know if This Is Your Life should be doing, you know, two guys talking and having balloons coming down from the sky should be doing five times more than a wrestling match is doing on the other show. So if they can spark a little new life into that show, it'd probably be healthier for, for our company in the long run. But uh, I hate to say it, but a lot of what I've seen uh, of their show is just duplicating what we have here. I mean, now they have a godfather there, and they have hoes of their own, and they have, uh, you know, uh, 
One of the things I noticed in the book, the introduction is written by Jim Ross, a good friend of yours, right? Ed Ferreira, the last couple of weeks, has come out and imitated Jim Ross. Right. Does that offend you? Yeah, I don't see uh, nerve damage as being a really funny thing. I mean, I, I, I hate to say this, but and I, but wh where is the line drawn between doing a, a Jim Ross parody and a Draws parody? I mean, it's, 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 it's a cold thing to say, and I hope Draws doesn't resent me for saying that. But neither one of them is funny. The fact that Jim Ross doesn't have use of some of his facial money, uh, facial muscles, to me, is not a source for humor. And the fact that uh, you know Ed Ferrara is doing that, I mean, I don't know who's doing that is, but I think it's uh, uh, it's kind of tasteless and cheap. But Mick, what happens when your company does something like that and you feel that way? I want to, like, for example, I was watching last week, um, and there was a work done between the big show and the, uh, the passing of his father and right. Bossman, and I watched that, and this is just my opinion, but I, okay. I was offended by that. It really bothered me. What happens when your own company does something that bothers you? It did bother me a little bit, uh, and I know big show was upset at, about the funeral scene because he said, you know, everybody thought it was a joke, and I said, do you know, that's when I started to enjoy it. My wife and I didn't like the, uh, the, the, the big show's father uh, dying scenario but as soon as a uh, boss man rolled down the road with a ridiculous car and the speaker system it became obvious that that this was not a real death we were talking about that this was part of the storyline and then I felt like I was free to enjoy it and now I can enjoy it um, I, but, but I, still I don't think that 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 approaches the boundaries of bad taste that, uh, that them making fun of JR crossed I want to ask you about working for a company and when you go over, I mean, because you worked for WCW and now you work for WWF, guys do go back and forth. Sure. Is it inappropriate for a wrestler who goes to the other guy to sell out on his former company? Dustin Rhodes, for example, goes over and on Nitro says, you know, I was gold dust with the other guys, but he sucked, or something to that effect. Well, I think Dustin Rhodes or Runnels um, has to remember that gold dust was the most successful thing he ever did in his life. And he already gave that speech once at WWF. And, uh, and I think at some point, guys have to look in the mirror and take a little responsibility for what they did. I mean, Goldust took Dustin Runnels out of the gutter and gave him a job and made him famous. Uh, the fact that it worked for three years is, 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 is pretty impressive. Now to go back and, and say that that nearly ruined his career, to me, is, is sour grapes and far from true. Talking about the other guys, the WCW, they lost uh, their biggest guy, uh, Hogan, right. uh, who would not lay down at the end, who would not tow the company line. Um, you think Hogan's gone? Do I think Hogan's yeah. gone? Come on, For now. Michael, come on. The guy uh, gave a retirement. Uh, see, then we talk about retirement. Anytime it's part of an angle, forget about it. There's no credibility in, in, in retirements now. There's, uh, you know, the loser must retire to me. That was always my dream to go out, to go out the loser and to retire and to draw big money doing it. But the fact is now, what are you going to do? Go out there and say, hey, I mean it. If I lose, I really am retiring. Not like uh, Sable, whose retirement lasted eight days. Not like Kevin Nash, whose retirement lasted six weeks. Not like even Vince, whose banishment from Raw lasted two months. I mean, What's wrong when, when you can't, uh, you know, when you lose your, your biggest money match? So now when a guy does retire, people go, oh, yeah, sure, you're going to retire. I mean, there's no dignity in it anymore. Well, we'll talk about your retirement and the dignity of your retirement. And more than anything, we'll talk about why. Okay. When Off the Record returns with Mick Foley, author of Have a Nice Day. Oh, and maybe a year or two down the line to come back for the one big match. I think it'd be great. It'd be something to look forward to. But I think as far as being a, a, a regular wrestling character, I'm, I'm done. Mick Foley in his book has chronicled all of the injuries. When you walked onto the set, you limped onto the set. You are a man who's put himself through um, way more punishment than any human being uh, would ever consider putting himself through in pursuit of greatness. Um, we're taping this show in advance. Probably by the time it airs, you've announced your retirement. Why? Probably. Um, uh, 
because I was relying on humor too much, and there was a sense that uh, I used to have a, a, a small list of things that I could do, and I did them very well. Uh, some things I thought I did better than anybody, um, but it was a pretty small list. And little by little, the list kept getting smaller to where it used to be, okay, my body's broken down, but I'll tell you what, I can take the hardest chair shot and I can take more than anybody. Then I start getting telltale signs of maybe taking too many chair shots, and now we have to cross chair shots off the list. I'm now on the list of guys who should never be hit with a chair again as long as they live. Um, and uh, just in the past few months, even the, the elementary moves uh, are becoming more difficult to do, and it just seems like it's been a long time since I've given the type of match that uh, I feel that I used to be capable of. And uh, I, I was named after Mickey Mantle, uh, baseball great. I used to hear my dad talk all the time. Not all the time, he wasn't obsessive about it, but he'd mention that Mickey Mantle uh, stayed one season too long. And uh, next year would be my one season too long. Because the truth of the matter is, the way wrestling has evolved, you could stay. You could stay as, as long as you wanted because guys don't always wrestle anymore. Well, it, you take a storyline. Right. You, you, could, you could be a commissioner like Shawn Michaels. Well, okay, here's where we say, okay, uh, this is a Hulk Hogan retirement where, I'm gonna, where I know I'm going to be back in six weeks. No. Am I saying I'll never be on the show again? Definitely not. I mean, I love, I love the business, and I'll even say it's a sport, because if you're going to include figure skating and golf, you have to include pro wrestling. That's my, that's my own commandment. I think I'm tailor-made for a commissioner, you know, and maybe a year or two down the line to come back for the one big match. I think it'd be great and be something to look forward to. But I think as far as being a, an, a regular wrestling character, I'm, I'm done. But a guy like St Stone Cold Steve Austin has sort of found a territory between what you were three, four years ago and right. what you are now. He has a disability that prevents him from truly wrestling the way wrestling was. And he's been able to maintain his persona by sort of finding that area in the middle? Yeah, uh, it's unfortunate in some ways that the wrestling shows are in competition with each other because I think you take a look at the rock and sock connection with some of the most entertaining things, uh, things I've ever been a part of. But even when me and Rock were doing these 20 minute long skits, our repartee, I was still wrestling every show. And, and, and it was little by little, I was, I was feeling like I was really wearing down. And, it's, it's, and when I spoke to Vince about it, two things came to mind. One, when I saw my uh, biography special in A&E, uh, Vince was already speaking as if he knew I was going to be retiring. This is long before I even mentioned it to him. And uh, second, as soon as I finished putting the last period on my book, I had this feeling that I've done all I've ever set out to do. I've far surpassed my goals. And it would be different when I spoke to Vince and, I, and Vince said, well, okay, if it was a knee, we could rehab it. You could drop some weight, make things easier on your back. When I started mentioning the little telltale signs of uh, head injuries, there's a point where you say, all right, I am willing to, I am willing to pay the price of being in pain for the rest of my life when I sit and play with my kids. I'm not willing to sit in front of the TV like a vegetable and uh, have people pity me and say he should have gotten out before that one last chair shot. Mick, are you protected enough by your sport as you call it? Um, here you are on the verge of retiring or maybe in fact you've retired and you have this litany of injuries and disabilities that will take you into the rest of your life. Right. Is your sport are entertainers like you protected enough by the sport? You don't have a union. Right. You don't, many of you don't have agents. Is anyone looking after your interest? And for the guys that are following, do you have concerns for them? Well, let me, uh, not, to, not to bring politics into, the, into the, uh, the show, but Jesse Ventura, he said he's a big believer in personal responsibility. We're making money, making a lot of money. Since the last time we talked, I made more money than I ever dreamed I could make kind of my responsibility to save that money and take care of myself. I don't, I don't really need somebody else to take care of me. I've been doing this for 15 years. There's a, a joke that says, what's the difference between a, a pizza and a family of four? Uh, the, <laughs> the <laughs> pizza and a wrestler, I'm sorry, what's the difference between a pizza and a wrestler? The answer is the, the pizza feeds a family of four. Wrestlers are, you know, unfortunately notorious for being, for spending their money. Um, and, uh, and I, 
I have not been one of those people. I mean, uh, we joked around the last time about how thrifty I was. Now I'm glad I was thrifty. You know, I'm glad I didn't buy new clothes or pay for a haircut in the last 11 years because uh, I'm in a, I am in a position where I can kind of pick and choose what I want to do. I'm not saying I'm set for life, but I'm saying, hey, You I should be set for life, though. <laughs> no, you should be set for life. Mick Foley, you're part of a company that just had an, uh, an IPO that generated a, m a billion dollars for Vince McMahon. You're a guy who poured his heart out into this company, who left part of his body. You should be taken care of for life. Are you criticizing Vince McMahon? Not at all. <laughs> I'm saying that if anyone... I've got a job in the WWF for life, if I want it, okay? That's been uh, presented to me. I'm sure Steve Austin could be a part of the company for life. Unfortunately, a, you can't include everybody, but the people who forged the company, who made the company what it is, I believe will be taken care of. So you feel taken care of? I feel like I'm going to be, I just don't feel like I need to be. Very well put. We'll take a break, and we'll return with some, some poignant questions for this man, Mick Foley. We'll talk about some rumors and the rest of the stuff when OTR returns. Here's some email which we received, which I think sums up the guy sitting beside me. Dear Michael, you should be honored to sit on the same set as the great Mick Foley. Mick is a great wrestler, great showman, and most of all, a great man. Drew from Sault Ste. Marie, and that reflects much of the email that we have received. There's our website, there's our email. Back with the great man in a moment. The name of the book is Mankind Have a Nice Day. I got to tell you, Mick, in general, sports books suck. This one doesn't. What makes this book special? I know I got something in All my right. mind. Okay, to me, is the fact that I wrote it. I did it myself. And no professional writer, no matter how talented or how good their diction or grammar, can capture the passion that I have for my subject. So I think that comes out. There may be a couple of, uh, of errors, you know, a couple of words. I may have used the word assuage too much. Uh, but all in all, I mean, I look at that, if you say, what am I proudest of in my 15 years of wrestling, I'd say that book right there. You're just another typical wrestler <laughs> who uses the word assuaged all the time. Mick Foley, Thank you're Michael. the best. Thanks for joining us on Off the Record. All right. Have a nice day. Off the Record with Michael Landsberg is brought to you by the Keg Steakhouse and Bar. For great steaks, good friends, see you tonight. Michael Landsberg's clothing, courtesy for you. It just got in my mind. I didn't realize when I read until I read it. I was like, I never once used the word relieved again. You know, I was talking about like swelling and uh, fears and and whatever could use the word.